Hey, how you doing? It's Friday. It's the 22nd of January, 2021, which means that yesterday I completely missed the opportunity to point out that we were on the 21st minute of the 21st hour of the 21st day of the 21st year of the 21st century. Now, I love numbers and facts and data and things like that. And I, I kind of try and make sense of the world by understanding all the knowledge, which reminds me of a song by Jesus Jones called Info for Eco. Uh, which is that there is no end to what I want to know. And if somehow I master all of the data, somehow I can understand the great mystery that is life. And as Madonna sang, life is a mystery, which, of course, is probably the only time I will quote Madonna in living memory. Um, this is the 49th episode of my uh, my so-called Notcast. And on the 49th episode, um, we are going to be talking about uh, a one of the... The worst albums by one of the best bands, New Order and Movement. And what can be more middle-aged bloke on YouTube talking about his record collection than talking about New Order? Not very much, to be honest. It's a very much a middle-aged dude in his house in the middle of lockdown talking about his records and his favourite bands. Uh, and what we're going to do is, is to talk through, I think, the, the album and the the time period running from the 19th of May 1980, the day after the death of Ian Curtis, uh, through to around about the end of 1982. And uh, as is normal, I am wearing a uh, thematically appropriate T-shirt. Uh, this one here is for Peter Hook's solo band, The Light and Their Movement Tour, which took place in 2013. Um, this was a heavily discounted T-shirt on the on the fact that when I bought it, the shows had happened over a year ago, and it is a medium, and that's why it looks tight on me because it was probably the last time I could fit into a medium, and the last time that I bought a medium-sized T-shirt. I prefer, as the Water Boys have it, room to roam, so I generally tend to buy large or extra large T-shirts these days. Now, you will notice seeing this that that looks oddly like this, and this is the cover of the, uh, the Factory Records CD released in 1981 of New Order's Movement album. But first, I have to give some chronology around what's happening. So, we start in May 1980, uh, a period that is, that is more than adequately covered, by the way, in this absolutely fascinating uh, collection of notebooks uh, called uh, Number One Top Class Manager by Rob Gretton. It is a collection of the working notebooks of the band's manager during the period of from when he became Joy Division's first manager through to the migration of the band from Joy Division to New Order. And possibly the, the most pivotal page in here, and one of the very last ones, is here, which is the, the, the note with the instruction to remind him to transfer £3,000 from Fractured Music, that's Joy Division, to New Order. Um, with weekly salaries for the remaining band members and obviously joining Gillian into the, the process as well. So the three remaining members of Joy Division, each of them have written a book about their time. And in the, uh, the old adage that there are the lies and the truth and the facts are somewhere in between, uh, Peter Hook has a very big book called Substance. It is approximately... Uh, the size of my ego. It's quite large. Uh, Bernard Sumner has a book called Chapter and Verse that details Joy Division and New Order. Uh, this one comes in at 342 pages. Uh, Peter Hook's book comes in at, I think it's something like 698. So let's quickly check the numbers on here. Uh, it comes in at 752 pages. Not quite as long as Lord of the Rings, but it certainly took longer to live than Lord of the Rings. And uh, Stephen Morris, uh, Joy Division's drummer, New Order's drummer, all-round human drum machine, uh, and probably one of the best drummers that I've ever heard, comes in at 456 pages. So somewhere in that, geez, that's a lot of words, isn't it? Somewhere in that 1,700 pages is the story of New Order told by all three members. Of the, of the band uh, that were also in Joy Division. The only member of New Order, the classic lineup that ran from 1981 to 1998, that hasn't written a book, is Stephen's wife, Gillian Gilbert, which I've obviously mispronounced, who gets an awful lot of coverage in this book as well. 
each of these books are well worth reading, well worth getting, and they allow you to make up your own conclusions about what happened in the band at the time. Um, there's also another, a couple of other books which are, I, I've mentioned. Um, this now out of print, Pleasures and Wayward Distractions, The Story of New Order and Joy Division uh, by Brian Edge. No idea who he is. Uh, there is a book about factory records which I have put in a corner and cannot find. And here is a book of New Order photographs by Kevin Cummings. And if you tweet a photograph of New Order or Joy Division or a photograph taken by Kevin, Kevin is keen to make sure that you quote him and you identify him as the owner of that particular piece of work. Uh, Kevin's on Twitter. And um, if you follow any of the uh, Twitter accounts that are related to New Order, Joy Division, uh, Morrissey, other Manchester bands... Um, Kevin will probably have appeared in that at some point. But uh, this this book by Kevin, um, well worth getting if you can find it. Lots of lovely black and white photographs and text and some weird and unusual things indeed. Clearly uh, a labour of love. You don't go into music or art to become staggeringly rich. Despite what my mum thought, she thought that when bands went up, they'd made enough money to retire and they were retiring. I was like, no, they're just fed up of each other. Um, and my mum couldn't get the concept past past her mind that, that bands could get fed up of each other and split up because they don't like each other. They thought that bands split up because they became incredibly rich. Um, clearly, a lot of musicians I know really wished that that was the reason why bands split up is when they had enough financial security to not have to do it anymore. Right, I'm rambling. I need to talk about uh, the first and debut album by New Order movement uh, released in October sorry not October November 1981 and the period that runs up to it so following the death of Ian Curtis uh, Joy Division had two songs which they were working through in states of completion uh, those songs were called Ceremony which had been played live at the last new uh, last Joy Division show in Birmingham and uh, in a lonely place which had been rehearsed but not re not performed live um, and the last Joy Division concert was on the album still released by joy division in september 1981 and movement the sequel to still came out two months afterwards uh, kind of like a very clear bookend of the joy division period and the start of the new order period in terms of recordings but some overdubs took place during the recording of movement um, to finalize and fix some of the the mixes and some of the bits that that hadn't been completed by the time Ian had died. <coughs> so the three piece needed a new name and uh, they needed a singer and they needed some songs. So according to, to Peter Hook's book, the, the, the week or so after Ian's funeral, um, he wrote Dreams Never End and then the rest of the band started rehearsing. They played their first show, I think it was the 29th of July 1980 in Manchester. I think it was at the Beach Club. Um, and they performed a set of instrumentals and new material. They completely locked away all of the old Joy Division material and started again afresh. Uh, they hadn't decided who was going to sing, so each member of the band took turns singing. Uh, Peter Hook singing some songs, Bernard singing some of the others, Stephen Morris singing some of them as well. And I think there's some video footage of, of some of those really, really early shows. Uh, on, on the movement box set that came out I think in 2019 which I still think of 2019 as last year even though it is actually two years ago and undeterred you know the band continued they started touring America effectively making up for the Joy Division tour that never happened uh, and lo and behold had all their equipment stolen I think it was in New York uh, and they were uninsured because they were poor and they had to come buy all their equipment again and start again so it really was a complete and utter metaphorical and literal clearing of the decks the band they had to change all their equipment they had to change their name change their lineup change all of their songs and all their repertoire but you know if you're a musician what do you do you give up get a day job well, musician that's what you do it's your thing and so they carried on um and some of the shows uh, were as a trio um were not particularly good there are some Pretty tough early audio recordings of it. And there's a description by a journalist which described New Order at the time as almost like a band decapitated. And I think that was that was probably a very good way of describing the way that the band was operating. Whereas um, in Joy Division, 
um, Ian would, would point out sections that the band were playing and go, we need to keep that, we need to repeat that, we need to order that. They've lost their ability. Um, they'd lost the person who, who was able to point out the sections that were worth keeping. And so they had to learn how to write songs all over again. They had to learn how to write lyrics and they had to start really from the ground up and, and not have the, the luxury of being able to to rehearse quietly. Uh, you know, they, they were a band that were born in public and they grew up in public. Um, and they, they still had a, you know, a legacy and there was an expectation that people would be going to see a band that no longer existed. Now, when I, well, you, I went to see the Mannix uh, a lot in 1996, uh, and that was you know, about 18 months after their guitarist, Richie Edwards, disappeared. And it was a really, really strange experience going to see them at that point because there were two, two audiences that were expecting to see two different bands. On one hand, there was a large audience of people that had heard of Design for Life, and they had a, a car, and they might start playing golf at some point you know and that was a band that was like oasis but welsh and then there was another bunch of fans that had grown up with the band through the years that were hoping to see traces of the band that used to exist that doesn't exist anymore and i think this is some of the things that happened with with new order actually as well as when they started off is there are a lot of people in raincoats that were secretly very very annoyed um that the band had dared to carry on without their singer um, and we're looking for a new singer, but I'm uh, anecdoting, and that is a very dangerous thing to do, especially considering I was only about eight when this was happening. So in uh, <coughs> several months later, New Order recorded their first single. This is Ceremony on 7-inch. Um, this copy is pretty battered, pretty scratchy. Uh, it's, uh, it's a dark... Fantastic song. Um, I, I've seen New Order play at, at pretty much every show I've seen. Uh, Peter Hooks played it at almost every show I've seen as well. I've seen Ceremony played live a lot. And it's always, putting it technically, a belter. Now, there are two recordings of Ceremony, by the way. As a general guide, the 7-inch and the green 12-inch were recorded by the three-piece version of the band. Um, these recordings are rougher, they're scrappier, they're louder, they're rockier. Um, and uh, you know you, the best way to tell the difference between the two, and I'm going to get very very boring here, is that you need to look at the uh, the run out grooves and the labels because some copies of the later recording of Ceremony will put in some leftover copies of the early sleeves. Generally, 90% of the time, if you get a copy of Ceremony that's green 12 inch, you're getting the first three piece version of the song that was the first a post joy division recording um and it's it's um a raw experience it's nowhere near as polished as the second version and the second version of, of ceremony was later recorded by a four-piece version of the band um most readily available on this 12 inch um but in the days when substance was released also the opening track on substance so if you have substance you have the re-recorded version of ceremony by the four-piece band after Gillian had joined now Gillian joined at the suggestion I think of Rob Gretton the idea being that um, Gillian was was a musician we, we no substantial prior experience and was able to to bend and move and to fit into the group dynamic easily compared to perhaps an established musician who'd already got preconceived ideas around it as you will see the uh the labels are slightly different it's got um i think a, this one's dated the 22nd of january 1981 so there are dates on the sleeves as well and the uh, the sleeve label on here is dated uh, sadly it's dated the 22nd of January as well. One of those dates is a liar because there are two separate recordings by two separate lineups, uh, some substantial period of time apart. Um, but Ceremony is a, a great debut single. It's a cracking song and uh, it, it's only when I saw New Order perform it live I realised how powerful that song was to be honest. There was something about standing in a room with the musicians, playing it live, who knows when we're going to get to do that again that really shows you know the strength and power of the song now new order wasn't the first name of the band it was the first name that they performed with um they didn't really have a name so i think when they played their first show they called themselves the no names um or they didn't announce their name 
And there was a, a debate around whether they were going to call themselves the Witch Doctors of Zimbabwe or whether they were going to call themselves New Order. And I think we all agreed that New Order was the, the right name for the group. Now, moving on from that, um, we have one of the most important uh, records in, in New Order's discography and very possibly one of the most important uh, records in 80s music, which is Everything's Gone Green. Here is the 7-inch the um, which was uh, backed with Procession. And the seven inch of Everything's Gone Green came out first before the 12 inch did. Um, and also there are nine separate colors for this. I have one uh, because by the time which I could conceivably go and find and track down all nine colors, I stopped giving a damn. Uh, and some of those colors I think are only available in certain countries as well. Um, it's a lovely bit of graphic design, again, designed by Peter Saville. Um, but everything's gone green, I think, is the, the, the precursor to an awful lot of music that was made in the 80s. You listen to it, it's a synthesis of uh, sequences, synthesizers, and a rock band playing at the same time in a way that, that no one else had really kind of tried to meld. You were, at the time, you were either very, very electronic, you were Depeche Mode, you were Human League, you were Kraftwerk, or you were very rocky, you know, it was like Echo and the Bunny Men and Pill and bands like that. And there, there was nothing really in the middle ground around it. And Everything's Gone Green was, I think, the first record that really pulled that middle ground together and kind of suggested an alternative um, or perhaps suggested a, almost a new genre. So this is the 12-inch the that was released at uh, Factory Benelux in Belgium. Uh, it was released later. It features a 12-inch mix of Everything's Gone Green. And it features two new tracks on the B-side, Cries and Whispers and Mesh. Although, on the back of this, it says it's Mesh and Cries and Whispers. And to be honest, I don't know the difference between the two songs. I've never particularly cared which one's Cries and Whispers and which one is Mesh. And the reason being is that New Order titles are basically abstract concepts pulled out of a shelf of VHS tapes. If you listen to their, or if you look at their song titles, an awful lot of them are named after old films. So, Thieves Like Us, Age of Consent. Um, you know, mesh, cries and whispers, um, everything's gone green. They're all kind of abstract concepts and, and titles that were named after films, TV shows and, and stuff like that. You know, by the time that you got to songs like, um, I think Confusion was probably the first song where you could clearly see a link between the name of the song and the song itself. Uh, I might be wrong. Obviously Love Will Tear Us Apart. Um, had its uh, own transmission and so on and so forth. That was a joy division. That was then. This is now. And uh, so Everything's Gone Green was the first time where the band also started to record without Martin Hannett. Um, Martin Hannett got bored and left whilst the band were doing the 12-inch mix of it. So the 7-inch mix of Everything's Gone Green is, is full 100% Martin Hannett. The 12-inch mix of Everything's Gone Green is an extended recording uh, mixed by Bernard and Hooky. Um, Stephen Morris had gone to bed, which is 100% um, Stephen Morris, I think, probably. It's a completely understandable position to be in. Uh, <coughs> at this point, the band were playing largely a set of new songs people didn't really know them they knew ceremony you know bootleg tapes existed uh, and the only way to really hear those songs was to hear a live recording or if you were perhaps particularly lucky uh, and you had access to it you might be able to find a peel session of it you know, the band recorded a peel session in january 1981 and um, so for nine months the only versions of songs off movement that you could hear in a studio recording were the four songs recorded for the first John Peel session on the 26th of January 1981 in London at uh, the, the BBC studios. And the band recorded four songs there, Truth, Senses, ICB and Dreams Never End. Uh, and as I've said, Dreams Never End is the, uh, the first song that the band wrote. ICB, according to some heartless people, stands for Ian Curtis Buried, which is bullshit. And that's uh, the direct... Uh, response to that rumour from a member of the band it, it hadn't even occurred to it um, Truth and Senses and ICB um, were also uh, and Dreams Never End obviously appeared on, on the Movement album um, but these are completely different alternate recordings and performances by the four piece and I'm going to come back to these later on because there's there's some I think it's interesting maybe not what other people find interesting uh, but frankly this is my not cast and uh, what I find interesting is what's interesting to me. And I don't do this for an audience. I do this because I've got nowhere to go and nothing to do. And I, I want to talk about the records that I love. Here is um, 
one of the more popular bootlegs. It was also later repressed probably about 10 years ago. Um, and it was recorded at the Glastonbury Festival in 1981. Glastonbury uh, is notorious, the 1981 show, as being absolutely terrible. Now, having listened to it, um, I can confirm it is New Order performing live, uh, and sometimes they're good, and sometimes they're very, very bad indeed. Now, the thing with live New Order in the 80s is that they really were at the cutting edge of technology. Um, they had sequences that never played the same pattern twice, uh, and sometimes they would start a song and they wouldn't know if the sequencer would start or where it would start or how it would work. And it's really, you know, riding the, the waves of terror uh, in front of an audience. So New Order shows were alternately either amazing or awful, or both at the same time. Sometimes they were uh, amazing and awful in the same song. And you got to remember, this is a band that, that completely changed their set list every night. So they had no set order that they were playing any of the songs in until that night. They would drop, chop, change songs. They would play a song once and then never play it again. There's a cover version of Sparks when I'm with you that I think they performed in Milan in 1982. Uh, it's the only time they've ever performed it. For example and um, so the idea of, of pacing and building a set list uh, was an alien concept it was largely a case of well we'll write down a bunch of songs that we feel might go well and if it works well we'll stick with that maybe for a bit but we'll, we'll change it up and we'll change it so you never knew what song you were going to get or what song was coming next there was no predictability in the set lists uh, there was no guarantee that you would get any one song so for example ceremony at the time that the band played glastonbury that was their first single it's not on here in a lonely place is on here, but ceremony isn't. Everything's gone green is on here, uh, but then it's uh, one, two, three, four. Yeah, so it's several songs that are unreleased in a row uh, from 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 the band, and there are a lot of live recordings of the band from this period. A lot of them are on YouTube. A lot of them are, are on various DVDs. Um, there's lots of material that's out there. Um, just go and have a look for it. And I'm going to go and put links to all the live shows up on the. On, on the comments section of YouTube. Uh, but Live New Order is, is always worth it uh, and always worth investigating and being interested in. And it's worth remembering that, uh, as I've said, the band could be amazing and awful and sometimes in the same song. So <coughs> that's the heavily bootlegged Glastonbury 1981 performance. Then still came out. Then we had on the 19th of November, 1981, the release of the New Order debut album movement and uh, this is an original factory records edition which i bought in about 1990 uh, this is not the original inner sleeve according to the catalogue number that's on here verh 53 i have taken this inner sleeve from the soundtrack to mark knopfler's uh, princess bride i don't give a shit uh, to be honest um i didn't care then and i don't care now uh, so this is the um the, the factory records 34 minute New Order debut album, and it, it's very, it, it's like baby pictures, musically, you know, the band are, it, it's not the best album, and it's not the best debut album, you know, the band were, were learning to write and record and perform in public in front of everybody else, they were, they were doing it in the public eye, and uh, it wasn't always easy, and it wasn't always good, um, there are eight tracks on here, uh, there's uh, Dreams Never End, Truth and Senses, which are on the Peel session. There's ICB as well. But there are four songs, Chosen Time, The Hymn, Doubts Even Here and Denial. Um, and really what this sounds like is I regard this as both the last Joy Division album and the first New Order album because instrumentally it's 100% Joy Division. It covers exactly the same kind of area. It covers the same kind of mood. Um, it's perhaps not... Melodically, it's nowhere near as strong. The lyrics are not particularly good. The production is terrible, and I, I'm, I'm going to address that in a minute. Um... But what it is, is that it sounds like an instrumental version of Joy Division fronted by somebody that's only just started singing, which is exactly what, what it is. Now, the recording of this album, Martin Hannett, I think, really struggled with the recording of this album. Partially, I think he felt that the band shouldn't have continued. And uh, partially, I think he was going down a different path to the rest of the band. So, for example, Martin Hannett was only mixing the versions of these songs that he preferred, so the only, and, and the mastering of them. So there are alternate mixes of movement which have been yeah, preferred by Martin Hannett. Those are the ones he worked on. Um, but the ones that the band preferred, uh, he wouldn't touch with a barge pole. So the band started to produce the material, started to mix the material, despite the fact that it's produced by Martin Hannett and engineered by Chris Nagel and assisted by John and Flood. Flood, by the way, um, the guy that later produced Q2 albums and Depeche Mode albums and lots of other albums that you like. And if you don't like them, you should like them. 
um, was, was an assistant on this, but also it was very clearly, you know, the sound of a band that was still inside the, the shadow and the footsteps of New Order. I don't know why I did that. Maybe I did. Who knows? Anyway, New Order's movement. Um, now, I think this is uh, an album of OK songs that has been mixed terribly. Um, the vocals are very, very, very quiet. They're submerged in production tri tricks. You can barely hear the vocals on this. Um, those finished mixes, which Martin Hannett preferred, where he was burying the vocals, presumably because he would have preferred a different vocalist to Bernard. Um, I think those mixes are atrocious. They are terrible. And if you want to hear how good those songs can be, um, find a copy of the Peel Sessions, the New Order Peel Sessions. Plenty of 12 inches issued by Strange Fruit in 1981 CD singles and this album, which compiles the two Peel Sessions together, which was released in 1990. Uh, the versions of the songs on the Peel Sessions album are infinitely superior. I have an alternate playlist of the album, uh, which starts with Ceremony, and it ends within a lonely place. And every single time there's a Peel Session version of the track, it plays that version instead. It makes the album far, far better. And I cannot mince my words. The produced version of Movement makes it my least favourite New Order album. Now, it might have been my least favourite New Order album anyway, but it became my least favourite because the production was so bad on it. And, uh, you know, hearing later live recordings of the songs of Movement, such as these by Peter Hook, shows that it's not the song's fault at all. You know, the songs are let down by bad production. Uh, and I know lots of people think that Martin Hannett was a genius. Well, he definitely wasn't a genius when it came to this record. Now, there's a multitude of versions of movement that came out. Uh, I'm going to quickly kind of touch upon some of the associated releases that go with it. Um, after the fact, there are at least three different editions of movement here is a 1986 factory record cd of movement um this is as close as you can get to the original version of the album that was released it's not remastered it's just a straight transfer of the lp masters onto a cd manufactured by factory records and it's um it's got a far better quality of sleeve actually so in 1992 when factory records went bankrupt and a company called Centre Date was formed that then sold the rights to New Order to London Records. Um, it was released on London Records here. And, <coughs> pardon me, there's the, some major differences around that. First and foremost, the Centre Date edition is covered in barcodes and extra uh, unnecessary text. Secondly, it's printed on cheaper paper. And it's been slightly remastered. It doesn't sound so good. So if you do get a chance to pick up a copy of the Factory Records version of Movement, it's about £5. Uh, it's well worth the £5 to get the original version of it. Also, many years... And, and that version of the CD on Factory came out in 1986. And around about the same time, Factory Benelux released the CD single of Everything's Gone Green, backed with Mesh and Cries and Whispers. At least it tells me it's Mesh and Cries and Whispers. Uh, and it, it replicates the running order that's on the inner sleeve here. But again, which song is which? I have no idea. Presumably, the only way you can tell which song is which is actually by, uh, by listening to a live recording and finding out when the song called Mesh was being played. Now, there is a deluxe edition of Movement that was released in 2008 uh, on London Records. Uh, I do not recommend buying these. Uh, and the reason I don't recommend buying them is because um, the first disc has been remastered. Um, in between the first and the second disc being compiled, the mastering company went out of business. And so the second disc is not remastered. It's not assembled with much care. Sometimes on some of the reissues, they, they put the wrong tracks, the wrong mixes, uh, the wrong banding on it. Um, and uh, Hookie had left the band by this point, And um, he was at war with, with everyone else who was involved with the New Order organisation at that time. So uh, getting the the quality control wasn't perhaps the most important thing for the for the band at that moment. Completely understandable, but uh, not not really worthy of the uh, the new order quality control that you have come to know and expect. Right. Also, on the day that Movement was released, uh, the band played a show at the uh, New York. Uh, Ukrainian Hall, I believe it was, on the 18th or 19th of November 1981. It was released as a sell-through VHS called Tarashevenko. It was also released on this DVD, 
316, uh, which features two live shows, uh, one from the Reading Festival in 1998, which is, is still probably the in my top five gigs of all time, and uh, the first New Order live show recorded and released, which was uh, New York in 1981, the day that Movement came out. Uh, I do recommend buying that, or uh, if you want to, and it's cheaper, watching it on YouTube, because everything is on YouTube these days. Now, Movement was released in 2019, as a super mega fancy pack ultra deluxe box set. Uh, there's also a box set version of Power Corruption and Lies. These box sets are staggeringly expensive. They are absolutely comprehensive in terms of their content, but they are staggeringly expensive. Uh, my suggestion is keep an eye out on them at Amazon. They come down to about £60. £60 is much more the, uh, the, the buying price for these. Uh, I think if you try and buy it from the new order, web store it's something like 120 pounds now for this you will get the original studio album on a cd and an lp you'll get a book you'll get a cd of demos and you will get uh dvds or a dvd of four live shows let's open up the box set and see what's inside it's actually now an unboxing video because this is a box set and i'm opening it so i'm unboxing the box set whoa um yeah okay all right calm your boots mate um, your boots. So, first and foremost, 48 page hardback book. Very nice, but I think really it, it, it doesn't, I'm not quite sure what the purpose is of this. Uh, yeah, handwritten lyrics, excerpts from Rob Gretton's notebooks, uh, essays, gig posters, things like that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to mention uh, Barney's thoughts, or sorry, Bernard's thoughts on the album as well. Here's a a reproduction of the uh, the album which features a an inner sleeve of sorts which is apart from tiny bits of typographical uh, unnecessary uh, contractual information is an exact reproduction of the original LP right down to the uh, the sleeves and the labels and everything that goes with it now one thing I haven't mentioned is the, uh, the the graphic design. So it's Fact 50. Every New Order album um, has a catalogue number that's a multiplier of 50 on Factory Records, by the way. Um, there's a, it's, it's based upon a, a poster by Fortunato Di Piero, uh, who I think is an Italian futurist. And um, the F there stands for Factory, and the L stands for 50, because the catalogue number is Factory 50. So it's pretty unambiguous, and obviously calling it Movement is a sequel to the Joy Division release still. Uh, the box set also has three, three extra discs in it, which for 120 quid isn't good enough. Um, you've got a card sleeve version of the remastered CD. You have Extras, which is an audio CD of extra material. So it's got uh, five tracks from the Western Works demos in 1980. Uh, it's got several songs from the Cargo demos in 1981. It's got an early mix of Ceremony, an alternative mix of Temptation, a rehearsal recording of Procession, and a rehearsal recording of Chosen Time. Uh, these curiosities, um, they're worth listening to. They're not worth coming back to. And there's plenty of other bootlegged uh, studio and live material which perhaps could have been on this release to, to make it feel a little bit more justifiable. The Peel Session from 1981. Hello. is not on there. And uh, you, you need to buy that separately. There's also a DVD. Now, the DVD features uh, one of the first live shows at Harrah's in New York in 1980 when the band, I think, were a three-piece and were juggling who was going to sing. Uh, there's a performance from the Peppermint Lounge in New York. Um, there's several songs from the Granada Studios in 1981. Um, and there's um, several songs from the BBC Riverside Studios in London in 1982 alongside about eight or nine other little bits of footage that were recorded with a single camera at the back of the venue uh, ranging from Manchester in 1981 to Minneapolis in 1983. It's you know, an interesting watch but it's not absolutely essential and I should point out by the way that uh, the um, there's some extra material from 1981 that's on this DVD, Live in Glasgow, from 2006. Uh, so it features three songs from the Manchester uh, ITV show, which aren't on this 
movement DVD here. So between these two releases, you can get the whole of the show from Granada Studios, which comes to eight songs. And there's also three songs from Glastonbury, uh, 1981, which are on here um, on this version. Uh, and there's some extra songs from Rome, Cork, Rotterdam, Toronto. Uh, as Stephen so eloquently puts it in his in his book, uh, come from <coughs> Stephen's big big old pile of crap. Uh, but as I understand it, he's using lockdown to digitise the existing and outstanding tapes, which is um, you know a great thing because they are going to be lost forever. Otherwise, uh, I'm pretty sure I have perhaps the only existing versions of a couple of live shows on cassette by other bands, and uh, you know, I'm not sure if those those will ever be heard again because I'm not. I never played it, took any care or attention of the tapes. I was just a teenager with some live shows. Of bands that I liked and you know the idea that I might want to listen to them in a digital format 30 years later once cassette players stopped being regular that was never a concept in my mind you know and and there's an earlier not cast where I talked through around you know um, the permanency of digital culture as you know things for, formats are fragile they don't last forever and um, we're gonna have to keep an eye on maintaining and upkeeping those if we want to make sure we don't forget our history <coughs> so what I haven't mentioned is um, there's a very interesting paragraph in Werner's book about movement, uh, where he says, I don't have fond memories of movement. It's certainly far from my favourite New Order album. I played it once or twice after it was finished, and I decided I didn't like it. I felt all the edges had been smoothed off, and it was devoid of its own identity and uniqueness. I really missed Ian being there, and his absence was something I was very aware of throughout the entire process. What I haven't addressed are the lyrics. On movement. The lyrics on movement were written by committee. So the three members of the band sitting together and going, what rhymes with bell? Hell. And what rhymes with soon? Moon. It was pretty much that level. And I think maybe one of the reasons that Bernard doesn't like the album is because it, it doesn't feel like it's a representation of his identity, uh, which is why New Order, I don't think of themselves, haven't played anything from the album live since about 1987. Although, as mentioned previously, uh, Peter Hook has played every song from his New Order repertoire uh, up to 1993, many, many times live. Um, and the first time that, you know, New Order starts to become New Order, as opposed to become a band in the shadow of John Division, uh, is on this here, the Live at Reading and Live at New York 1981 DVD. Um, they performed Temptation. At that point, it was called Taboo Number no. 7, I believe. As one of the last songs and um, at that point the band was still playing live improvising the arrangements the lyrics the vocals the melodies so what you'll often get is you'll often get an instrumental version of a song because they haven't written the lyrics for it yet or they haven't written the melody for it yet um, and they were doing this right up to about 1986 so for example I think early versions of the perfect kiss one of the early versions was called I've got a cock the size of the M1 uh, which I think was performed at the Royal Festival Hall in 1984. Um, that is not the final lyric that appears in the song. Um, and also there's a song called Let's Go that the band released in 1987 on the soundtrack album to Salvation, which is here. Um, but there's a vocal version of it um, where various iterations of the song performed live went through various vocal versions. And uh, there's also, um, I think one of the other songs, I think it's Skullcrusher or Sputnik, uh, was also they they played it live and they they worked through various vocal arrangements of it before they decided to stick it as an instrumental version on the soundtrack album. Um, so New Order really are growing up in public on this release. And with Temptation, it's the first time that you hear New Order being New Order and not a band that also used to be Joy Division. Um, and that came with the release of in 1982 one of the finest 12-inch singles of all time. This is Temptation, and if I can get the light to hit it just right. Uh, you can see that this is uh, the indented sleeve. Aren't you lucky listening to me talk about my records? Ah, how exciting. I bet you wish that you were just a geek instead. 12 inch thing. <coughs> Imitation is the original factory records version. All of these early 12 inches have been repressed uh, in near perfect and authentic reproductions, by the way, but considerably cheaper than the factory records versions are. And I should point out, and I don't want to sound too 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 much like old father time here um 
they sold a lot of copies of these records. You know, when I started getting into New Order, which was 1987, you know, you could easily pick up any New Order 12 inch brand new for £3.49 from HMV, or you could pick it up second hand for about £2. The world was literally flooded with copies of this, especially Blue Monday. Uh, but it was very, very easy to find originals that had been loved and, uh, well, not necessarily cared for. So there's two versions of Temptation. There's two recordings of Temptation. And there's two recordings of Hurt, which is the B-side, which originally was called Cramp. This version is a 7-inch that runs at 33 RPM, uh, just over 5 minutes. This is a 12-inch version that's 8.5 minutes long. So this version has a hard ending and fades out. This version has a fade in and a different ending. Um, and it's, they're different recordings. They run at slightly different speeds. You can't splice the two together to create one master version of the track. Um, I've done a crossfade which I'll link to, uh, which creates a 10 minute version, which has the intro from this and the, the end of this creating a 10 minute master version of the song. Um, but effectively, these are two different studio recordings at the same time, different performances. The sequences run at very slightly different speeds between the two recordings. You would only know if you did a back to back. A to B comparison. And on the B side, by the way, is Hurt. Again, different recordings, different performances, because there are a different set of drum patterns and fills on this version than there are on this version. I know because I listen to both of them at the same time, because that's the kind of guy that I am. And uh, to further kind of muddy the waters a little bit, uh, in the late 80s, uh, there was an EP uh, called 1981-1982 that was released in Canada and some other places. Um, which had the A sides of the two 12 inch singles. So it had Everything's Gone Green, Procession, and Mesh on it, and also had Temptation and Hurt on the B side. Effectively a mini album. Um, it was available on CD. It's very hard to find now. I had a look for it on Discogs, and it comes to something like £80 to get a copy. And primarily because if you look carefully closely here, uh, what we've got is we've got some, some flakiness on the silver of the CD. Of course, at the time I bought this for four pounds in about 1991, I didn't give two hoots about what it was gonna look like 30 years later. I was convinced that by the year 2021, we'd have hover jets, robot dogs, and sentient celluloid uh, Android butlers. Um, Temptation's a great song, um, but it's where new order start becoming new order and start being joy division. And I'm gonna close off with probably the, the last thing from, from 1982 uh, that was released. Um, I'm also going to mention, by the way, before I get to that, because that one's pretty good, there was a Pill session in 1982 that was recorded in the band studio um, that has four songs on. Um, the Pill session from 1982 is on the uh, Power Corruption and Lies reissue, uh, but again, if you can get the eight-track version of the Pill sessions, it's on here as well, and that features Turn the Heater On and Too Late, which are two songs which haven't been released elsewhere, and early versions of We All Stand and 586, which appeared on the Power, Corruption and Lies album. But the last thing the band released in 1982 um, was this. This is the Merry Christmas from the Hacienda uh, flex disc that was given away free to people that went to New Order's nightclub, the Hacienda in Manchester on the 24th of December, 1982. Um, there was one copy pressed for each person in the capacity of the club, club 4,400 copies uh, were originally in existence. By the end of the night, since most people didn't want to go to a uh, Christmas Eve disco and tote around a flexi disc, most people were too drunk to remember to pick it up on the way out. So you could get a copy free by writing to factory records. Or if you're me, you buy it from a, a record shop on the seafront in Redcar in 1992 for six pounds um, after factory goes bankrupt. But anyway, it sells for a bit more than that. This is crap. Uh, it's a cover version of, I think, Ode to Joy and Rockin' Carol, uh, recorded by Stephen Morris, uh, punching in an endless number of zeros and ones into a very primitive synthesizer. It is absolutely shit. Uh, and you can listen to it for free on the internet. It's certainly not worth paying for. Now that brings up to the end of uh, episode 49 of the Notcast and covering New Order's Movement album, the um, single Ceremony, Everything's Gone Green, Temptation and uh, Happy Christmas from the Hacienda. And the next episode is episode 50. I don't know when I'm going to do it. I don't know what it's going to be about. Uh, I can guarantee it's not going to be about New Order because I've just done one about New Order. I will think of something and ramble about it at the time. As per usual, don't be a dick in the comments. Stay beautiful. And I will see you again next time. Um, any questions, put them in the comments box. 
I'll pop it out in the comments box with links to live shows from the era and um, anything else that I think of. Right, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to have a cup of tea. I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to go and watch The Last Leg on Channel 4 because it is Friday night. All right, see you later. Bye. <laughs>